we can kind of uh, get into a routine with church, and we forget um, we forget how church feels to people that aren't church people, uh, and we forget to ask essential questions like, "What in the world are we doing here?" Uh, this is uh, strange human behavior uh, that we do here every Sunday. And so what is all this about? And that's what we're going to be um, digging into for the next several weeks um, here at The Story with a series called Semi-Organized Love. Last week was unbelievable. It was unreal. Uh, Easter Sunday uh, it took me uh, half the week just to recover uh, from it. Uh, not just the exhaustion from it. I was nervous the night before, so I didn't sleep then. And I was like excited the night after, so I didn't sleep then. And uh, so, you know, it was like I, uh, I woke up on Wednesday evening, like what happened? You know, like, uh, and so it was uh, one of those weeks, but um, exceeded everybody's expectations, right? It was incredible. Uh, four services and uh, 12 baptisms and uh, a lot of other people recommitting their lives to Jesus. And, and, uh, and for the first time ever at the story, we had a, over 1,000 people on a Sunday, which was uh, kind of a cool milestone um, for us uh, a little over two years in. Don't go telling your friends that my church has 1,000 people because it was Easter. So <laughs> it's a little bit of an outlier uh, if you look at the whole you know, trend or whatever. But it was really cool to see. Half of those people came at one service. 940 had 500 people in it, um, which if you look around this room right now, there's probably 250 people in this room right now. So imagine double the number of people in this room at the same time. And just conceive, if you will, of how many laws were broken during that one service. Uh, how many lives were put at risk in the name of Jesus uh, for that service. So uh, everything, everything turned out okay. So the end justified the means. Just don't tell the authorities. Okay. So uh, it was an incredible, incredible day. Um, it, was, it was exciting. But as exciting as Sunday was, and it was, one of the most exciting days of my life, honestly. Um, what was in some ways more exciting was what happened two days later on Tuesday when our leaders and our staff started getting together to kind of talk about what happened Sunday. And I'm kind of an easygoing guy. I'm not exactly a type A personality. Uh, I probably would have appreciated uh, a whole day of like uh, patting ourselves on the back. A little bit of self-congratulations, you know, like a little ego stroking would have been nice. That is not the kind of leadership we have at this church, let me tell you. So uh, this was hard for me at first, but after I sat with it for a second, I was like, this is the best thing that could possibly happen. Because we sat around two days after the biggest and best day in the story's short life so far. And uh, the, the first thing, the only thing people wanted to talk about is how to make next Easter even more amazing for our guests. And it wasn't just blind ambition, like, we want a bigger church, let's build an empire. It was like, we know what we're called to do here, so let's do it better. And so there were things like details, like we can't make that many people stand in a line in the sun outside for that long next year. We're going to have to plan ahead, and we're going to have to space our services out different, or we're going to have to get a temporary covering on that, something to make it a better experience for for our guests, right? And they said, well, we're gonna have to, uh, we're gonna have to have a different number of services at different times. We're gonna have to do children's ministries different. Hospitality's gotta be better. Signage has gotta be better. And I'm just like getting stressed out over there. Like, guys, come on, like, let's just have a party. Like, I, it was good. And then they were like, and then they're like, oh, and by the way, you can't preach for 40 minutes on Easter, Eric, you know? And uh, that one really hurt. That one was, uh, was uh, it was tough, but I understood it. Because I know the hearts of the people at those tables, the leadership of this community. I know why they were saying what they said. And it's because they understand the core principle, the foundational idea of this community. You know, every organization of people that's ever been, any kind of organization, has a foundational idea. The idea that, that the rest of the culture is built upon. So your company has a foundational idea. Whether they name it or not, it's there. Uh, your family has a foundational idea. The foundation on which the rest of the culture of your family is built. Every human group has a foundational idea. Our foundational idea at the story is making Jesus known to more people in Houston, especially non-religious people in Houston, by making the church experience more approachable, more uh, unassuming, and simpler than people ever thought it could be. And so it was from that idea that those ideas uh, came on Tuesday. Because at the heart of it, we know the reason God put us here is because people have gotten the wrong idea about the church. And more often than not, your friends, or maybe some of you, 
if you're asked to define the church, you would define it something like uh, as a place, a building. The church is the building where Christians go, is normally how we conceive of church. It is the place or the building where Christians go to feel safe and separate from the outside world while their needs are being met by a paid professional pastor or priest. That is how people, subconsciously even, conceive of church. That's what your friends think you're doing here now, is escaping the world in a building and being coached up by some, you know, guy with a seminary degree, a pastor or a priest uh, type of person. Um, That is, unfortunately, uh, the definition also of organized religion. People think that's what church is, organized religion. Even some Christians conceive of church this way, unfortunately. Uh, Some of you uh, lifelong Christians might think of the church as a building. You say, I'm going to church. What do you mean? I'm not going to go be with people and a building. I'm going to go be at the building with people. I'm going to go to the church. The church is a place, a destination, and not so much a people. We're just just sort of trained to not even question this, to think about the church as this building. And what I want to say today is that this building is a sacred space, but it's only sacred because of the Spirit of God being here and all of you being here. Even a space like that great, big, awesome, beautiful sanctuary on the other side of the campus here, you know, one of the most beautiful sanctuaries you'll ever be in. It's only sacred because God is there and the people of God are there. Otherwise, it's just four rooms, four walls and a, and a, and a roof, right? Uh, and so um, we, have to, we have to reimagine what church is. A lot of people think about church, even Christians, as a building where people come to feel safe and inspired by a, by a public speaker. Maybe even he's or she's entertaining. Maybe they'll make you laugh and, like, make it all a little better. Like, that's how we think about the church experience, um, which uh, is so painfully, brilliantly portrayed in the video you're about to see. This was going around on the internet a little bit. You might have seen it. Uh, it's uh, some very funny Christians uh, who decided to do a Christian retelling of the House Hunters show. It's called Church Hunters. Hope you enjoy. Previously on Church Hunters. This is your first church. This is Creekside First Baptist. Honestly, right up front, uh, didn't love the name. The Sunday morning experience was just little too traditional. Hey guys, how we doing? Hey, good. Doing how are good, you? Doing good, doing good. So I know you didn't love the traditional vibe of the last place, okay? Yeah. okay. But I think this church is really going to do it for you. Yeah. It takes relevance to a whole new level. Behind me, you will see molded clay, jar art, tapestry, canvas, mosaic wow. church. Mm, I love beautiful. it. Right? So you've, you've heard of interdenominational. Mm-hmm. Right. And you've heard of non-denominational. Mm-hmm. Well, this church identifies as interdenominational. Wow, that's, that's perfect for it. us. It really is. But here's the kicker. A lot of celebrities go here. Yeah. What? Jeff Foxworthy. Oh. <laughs> we love him. Yep. We really do. Ben Higgins from ABC's The Bachelor. <gasps> perfect. Several Real Housewives. Ooh, and know. Usher even came here one time. <laughs> yeah. Shut up. <laughs> yeah, wow. well, follow me. Come on. Let's do it. <laughs> so refreshing. Honestly, that last trip was just way too traditional. It was yeah. too much. It was like we left there feeling convicted. Like, uh. ugh. Right? Right. We're just, we're looking for more of a Tony Robbins type sermon. Like inspiration, like a TED Talk with a Bible verse. Yes. Oh, yes. Right? It's perfect here. We love it. It really is. We love it. Awesome. Cool. Well, you guys know a lot of contemporary pastors speak out of the Message Translation Bible. Mm -hmm. Right. Or this pastor speaks out of a brand new translation. It's the Tumblr Bible. Shut up. We love Tumblr, though. This is great. A lot of emojis, a lot of abbreviations. Oh, I couldn't ask for one. And how many seats in here? Oh, it is 6,000 altogether. Babe, 6,000. Wow. I gotta be in this worship band. That's Imagine true. me up on that Jumbotron mid guitar solo. Do you know how many Instagram likes you get? Oh. oh my gosh. We find it hard to find a church right now because I grew up Catholic. I grew up and Baptist, so. So, like, we, we drink. Yeah, but in private. I mean, obviously you get it. Basically, in terms of like worship, I think we're looking for like a Jesus culture type feel. Oh, I right. love them. Hillsong, obviously. Oh, leave you to the cross? Hillsong's great. Like a Bethel minus the spontaneous yeah. stuff. Yeah. Just for me, I connect in worship more when the leader is attractive. Personally, I'm a Carrie Job guy. Oh, okay. Well, she's married. So. Um, so is Christian Stanfield. Wow. <laughs> so one of my personal favorite things about this church is the service times. Okay. There's an 8.30, a 10, a 1 o'clock, a 5.30, and even a 7 o'clock service. Oh, there's nothing around like 2-ish? Yeah, for us, 
For what we need, 2, 215 is best. Yes. Uh, how many songs do they do during worship? Usually five, five and a half, depending on where the spirit leads. Oh, wow, babe, is that, is that a lot? Well, if that's too that much for you, like they have a program here called the Worship Assist Program. Okay. So if you ever get tired during worship, an intern will come out and just hold your arms up. You just keep worshiping the King of Glory. Just like that, wow. I love it. Oh, you can still look super spiritual. Mm -hmm. And my arms get so tired from yoga. Oh, same. I actually like this church. I think we can make it work. It was all right. I mean, it was it was good, but pers like I emailed the pastor and he didn't immediately respond. So uh, we're taking these vessels elsewhere. It's funny because it's true. And it hits a little close to home, uh, but this is kind of the absurd uh, way that we think of church or looking for a church um, as uh, we would look for a club or, you know, some kind of other uh, community organization where customer service um, should come first. Uh, and this is uh, unfortunately the definition of church many Christians have. It's just not the definition of church that Jesus had. And if we're going to mo pattern ourselves after any definition of church, I hope Jesus is the authority that we look to. It will take a little bit of intentionality through this series. We're going to be peeling back a lot of layers of assumptions that we make about church. But we're going to get to the heart of what Jesus said the church is. Because far from being a building where Christians gather to, be, to feel uh, safe and separate from the world outside and where a paid professional meets everyone's needs, Jesus called the church, uh, you know, uh, something other than even, he never even said the word church. Church is a word that came about a lot later, like the 16th century is where we get the word church. It's where what Jesus said church is became a building, became a place, because when Jesus said church referred to what we call church, um, like for example in Matthew 16 verse 18, when his disciple Simon says, I don't know what everybody else is saying about you, Jesus, but I'm saying you're the son of God, you're the Messiah, Jesus says to Simon, he says, you're right, you're so right, you're not even Simon anymore, that's how right you are, which is good news for any man named Simon, to not be Simon anymore, it's the great news ever, right, so, so like you're no longer Simon, not only are you not Simon, Jesus said you're the rock now. That's your name is The Rock. So a guy named Simon becomes The Rock, which is the best upgrade that any guy named Simon could ever wish for. And he says, uh, your name is Peter, which means literally The Rock. And upon this rock, Peter, I am going to build my, you've all heard church. Jesus didn't use the word church. And he wasn't talking about four walls and theatrical lights and projectors and everything else. He was talking about something far different. The word that he used was a Greek word, ecclesia. Ecclesia is, uh, was a very, very common word. The great thing about ecclesia is that there's no guessing what it meant. It's in so many other um, pieces of uh, literature and writing from the same time, temporary to the Bible, that we know exactly what somebody who said ecclesia meant. And it was a secular word. No religious undertones at all at the time. When Jesus says, my ecclesia, he's talking about a gathering. Really, the word is an assembly. He said, I'm calling an assembly. So the ecclesia in Jesus' day was where the Senate was called to come do the work of the Senate in the capital. Uh, an ecclesia was, you know, the assembly that middle schoolers went to in the cafeteria. Like, that was what an ecclesia was. It was a meeting called by someone involving a bunch of people for a purpose, and it had very little, no really, uh, religious ramifications. Jesus said, I'm, I'm calling an assembly for a specific purpose. And what's that purpose? Throughout the New Testament, throughout the book of Acts, we're going to see that that purpose is uh, making disciples. Making disciples who change the world. Making the disciples who change the world in Jesus' name and for his sake. Now, for Jesus, that's what church was always meant to be the gathering of people called together by Jesus for the purpose of making disciples. This is where we came up with this idea for a sermon series that's starting today called Semi-Organized Love. It is a rebuttal against what the church has become. Because, guys, if you love this community, what I'm saying today and through this series is that over the next six months to a year, we will be deciding 
with the choices we make and the ways that we budget and program. And we're going to be deciding who this community is going to become, what we're going to become, whether we're going to cave to every temptation in which those temptations will come to become organized religion, whether we will forsake being what we were that got us here to this point and instead put a lot of structure around this thing, make this thing about a personality or a person and make this thing about customer service, or whether we're going to be true to Jesus' definition of ecclesia, the assembly, the church. And so um, what we're going to do through the next seven or eight weeks is go through meticulously the book of Acts. The Acts of the Apostles is the fifth book in the New Testament. It is um, the first book after the four Gospels. It should be right there together with Luke, uh, John, and his Gospel kind of get in the way. So it goes Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and then Acts. The reason Luke and Acts should be together is that they're really one book written by the same guy. It's kind of a sequel situation. Uh, and I, I think, uh, you know, I think Luke just kind of wanted to, uh, to double his profits a little bit like uh, they did with The Hobbit. Remember when they like broke up the movie, and, like the last one? And the, the same thing with the uh, Catching Fire thing. What was that? Uh, Katniss. Yeah, that was whatever. And so the, they, they break up the sequel. So I think that's what's happening here. It's really the same book written to the same guy, by the same guy. Luke, a Gentile physician, probably the only non-Jewish guy to write anything that made it into the Bible. And so he's got a different perspective. He's a physician, highly literate and intellectual. And he's writing in the 40s and 50s, and his work is finalized in the 60s when the leaders of the church are all being killed off. And uh, he's writing to this guy named Theophilus. Theophilus was either the name of an individual, which was a pretty common name at the time, believe it or not, uh, or a community. It basically means beloved by God, literally. We almost named this this community inside of the story, we almost named it Theophilus, and I'm, in retrospect, very happy with our choice to name, to name it the story, uh, but we were close to naming it Theophilus because Luke wrote it, St. Luke's, you know, we're part of St. Luke's, and this, anyway, uh, it seemed like a brilliant idea at the time. Uh, and so he wrote it to Theophilus, and um, my hunch is, as many scholars say, uh, is that Theophilus asked Luke some questions. Theophilus was a skeptic. Theophilus had questions about Jesus and the reality of his resurrection in the church and what the role of the church was. And so Luke writes his Gospel of Luke and the book of Acts, the Acts of the Apostles, as a response to Theophilus' questions. You'll see what I mean um, when, we, when we read the first few verses of Acts. Open your Bibles if you have them or your Bible app on your phone or uh, your study guide. Your study guide has all the scriptures uh, on them or you can just follow along on the screen. Acts chapter 1. Verses 1 through 11. All right, y'all follow along with me. It's a little bit longer than some of our Bible passages are, but it's really important as we set the table for the rest of this series together. Luke says, in my former book, Theophilus, that's the gospel of Luke that he's referring to. In my former book, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven. After giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen, after his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command, Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for my gift the Father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? And he said to them, it is not for you to know the times or the dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Jerusalem was the city where they lived, Judea, Samaria, the outlying areas of that city they were less familiar with, and then to the ends of the whole earth. After he said this, Jesus was taken up before their very eyes. A cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking up intently into the sky as he was going, and suddenly two men dressed in white stood behind them, saying, Why do you stand here looking into the sky? The same Jesus who's been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. Why, they say, why do you stand here looking up? That's the line that stuck out to me. Why do you stand here looking up? Because I think if you asked your friends to be honest about what happens inside churches, they would probably say it's a bunch of Christians standing there looking up, doing very little, 
um, just worshiping this invisible God. This is the posture many people have in mind when they think of Christians standing around looking up. Five minutes before this happened, Jesus said, look guys, you're going to be filled with the Spirit. You're going to go and be my witnesses to Jerusalem, Samaria, Judea, and the whole earth. And, uh, and now they're standing there looking up. It's understandable because Jesus was just there and then he wasn't. He's like hiding in the clouds and he's like showing off. You know, like, come on, man. Like, why do you leave us again? What are we supposed to do now? And these two men stand behind them. Presumably they're angels or messengers of God. And they say, guys, why are you standing around looking up? Look around you is the implication. Look around you at the world around you. And they say, why are you just standing still? The implication here is get to work. There's stuff to be done in the world. The church, the Ecclesia of Jesus is not about sitting around or standing around together because there's stuff to be done in this world if we'll keep our heads down, keep our eyes open, and serve the world around us. The church of Jesus was never and should never be an institution, a denomination, a system of organized religion, a corporate ladder that guys like me climb. It should never be any of these things. It should only and always be the people of Jesus called together by him for the purpose of making disciples who make a difference. That's all the church was always meant to be. Now, in a word, uh, I guess you could sum this up, and I'm, I'm so afraid of saying this word because I'm afraid when I say it, some of you guys are going to turn this whole sermon off and you're going to get your phone out and be like, I'm, I'm on my Bible app, and you're going to be on some social media app, and I'm just going to lose you forever and I'll never see you again. Like, guys, in a word, if I could sum up what we're supposed to be about here, the word would be evangelism. Ugh. Nobody says anymore because evangelism is about as popular as a root canal. Like nobody wants to be the evangelist. Nobody wants to be even evangelical anymore because that's all political now and it's all like it feels gross to us. It feels like a heavy-handed like proselytizing and somehow we've not only added on layers of meaning to what church was supposed to be, we've added on layers of meaning to what evangelism is supposed to be because evangelism at its heart is very, very simple. It's all about sharing the good news of God's grace in Jesus and it's not preachy and it's not super religious and it's not notches on Christians belts how many souls we won today it's not about any of that it's about sharing the gospel of Jesus with your actions or with your words evangelism unfortunately we've got a different picture of evangelism we've got the picture of evangelism with the guy with the megaphone or the bullhorn outside NRG Stadium telling the whole world why God hates them and why he can't wait to punish them. And, you know, everybody has that in mind. We think of evangelist or, or an evangelist uh, in doing evangelism. Now, for us, evangelism is entirely different. Sadly, if, <laughs> even if you loved this service, if you love the music, love the sermon, whatever. If somebody came up to you after the service and said, we've had our eye on you and we'd like you to join our evangelism committee, we would never see you again. We, you would get out of here, so you'd give us the wrong number to call and you'd be an Episcopalian next week. Like, you'd be the first visitor up the street at that Episcopalian church in 25 years and then you'd, they'd love you because they hadn't seen you before and, they, they, and you'd be so happy, you'd be bored to death. We'd be so happy because... They don't have an evangelism committee. They're going to make you be on. I love you, Episcopalians. And that wasn't directed at any particular Episcopalian church up the street. I promise. I don't even know how many there are. All right. So <laughs> I'm digging myself a hole. How do I get out of this hole? Uh, so the, the truth is we don't have an evangelism committee either because that would be redundant. Because if we had an evangelism committee, it would seem like it's the role of that group of people to do the work of the whole church. Everything we do is evangelism. Everything we do is strategically sharing the gospel of Jesus persuasively. Because we believe that when people, when a person makes the gospel of Jesus the center of his life, everything in him and around him changes for the better. I think Jesus makes your life better. 
And I think through your changed heart, he will make the world around you better. That's why we're doing what we do. That's why, yes, evangelism is persuasive. And honestly, let me just lay it all out there. If, it's, if you're new here, you're going to think this is all like a bait and switch. Even things we do like the charity trivia night. I love blessing a local charity. I'm all about it. But the end game here isn't just what happens on one night for one charity. The end game here is what Jesus can do with people's hearts when all the, the nasty sort of layers we put on the church and put on Jesus and put on evangelism is stripped away by him and he softens a heart and then he changes the world around that person through that one softened heart. That's always what we're up to. <laughs> Events, children's church, uh, service and missions, all of it. Is about making Jesus and his gospel known. It is all evangelism. It is all evangelistic. This is our foundational idea. So this building is nice. You all agree? You like it? I kind of like it. This building is nice, but it's just a tool. If this building was gone tomorrow, the church, the story would still exist. It's just a tool. It's a nice tool, but it's a tool. Uh, you know, the money that we give, it's very nice. Thank you. But it's just a tool. It's a tool, right? The services we have, the songs we sing, all of it is, uh, is a tool. The events, the chapters, uh, the story, all of it is a tool. You guys, actually, when you join the church, uh, when you join it, when you're a part of the church, it's not for guests, but you guys have joined the church. Jesus loves you, I love you, but you're a tool. Like, you can look at, look at the person next to you. Go ahead and tell them, you're a tool. Go ahead and tell them. I know you've been waiting to. Go ahead and tell them, you're a tool. All right, some of y'all like that too much. Uh, <laughs> married couples, turn, tone it down a little bit. Tone it down. You're a tool for a greater end. And that's what evangelism is. It's being changed by Jesus to change the world in his name, we believe Jesus makes lives better and Jesus makes the world better. In fact, I would go so far as to say that there's nothing in the world that has ever changed the world quite as much as one heart changed by Jesus. Nothing will affect that person more. Nothing will bring a greater end, a greater result in that one person. Let's call this guy, he's a man. Let's say nothing will change this man's life more than Jesus being at the center of it. Now, therapy is really a good idea for a lot of guys. Like, therapy is great. Counseling is wonderful. Medication can be a godsend. Socialization is very useful. Education is vital, but nothing will change his heart fundamentally from the inside and make him a new man like Jesus at the center of his life. And when he becomes a new man who patterns his life after Jesus, everything else outwardly changes too. He becomes a more passionate husband. He becomes a more patient father. He becomes a more diligent worker, a more generous citizen of this city and of this world. Nothing changes a man or the world around him like Jesus being at the center of it. And that's why we do what we do. And this ecclesia, this assembly of Jesus, it's happening here every Sunday, but it's not just happening here. It's happening as we speak of all places at Pam Lynchner State Jail where a group of like a dozen guys from the story are having church all weekend. They give their whole weekend away. As busy as people are, they give their whole weekend to have church in jail with, as they call them, they're not inmates. And they're not criminals. They're our brothers in white. And they fed meals to these guys and they've worshiped and they've taught the Bible with these guys and I'm headed there right after this service is over to go and have a final closing ceremonies with them and you would not believe the life change that's happening in the lives of these men and I don't mean the men on the inside. I'm sure some of their lives have changed too but if you really want to know who's been transformed it's the guys who wear shirt and ties during the week and then they spend the weekend at jail on the inside and their lives are never the same. Jesus has worked a miracle. And they bring the miracle home with them. And they take the miracle on the dating scene with them. They take the miracle to their kids to work. 
Everything is different because of Jesus being at the middle. This ecclesia, this assembly, it happens through a ministry called Healing Hands, which is a ministry that so many women in this congregation are so passionate about. Like they get together in that back room and they scheme and plot and plan and cry. All this stuff about how are we going to bless these families who are going through hell on earth with their kid in the hospital, with an infant in the NICU, how are you going to bless them? And what drives women who have plates that are full to overflowing already with their own families, their own jobs, their own lives, everything, to go out of their way to be a blessing to people they don't even know? It's because Jesus is at the center. And when Jesus changes your heart, you know I'm not living just for me. And so it it's on the move, this assembly, this gathering, this church Jesus started. It can't be stopped, and it can't be confined to any four walls. And it's happening now as we speak across the parking lot where those children's church volunteers have prepared, you guys. They have prepared, and they have dressed up in costumes like this guy on the screen with a purple velvet robe. That is not what he normally wears, you guys. He is like a white-collar professional, but he will do anything to keep those kids' attention because he is driven by Jesus to make children's church compelling for kids because he believes he's doing more than entertaining them for half an hour. He believes he's raising up little disciples who will change the world. Our children's church is full of amazing, amazing volunteers that are changing the world one heart at a time. Ecclesia, the gathering, the assembly is on display every Sunday morning as well as all of our teams and volunteers show up early. Y'all get here at 11.05 or if you come to the 9.40 service, sometimes you're here at 9.40. If you come to 5 p.m., you get here at 5 or 5.10, 5.15, some of y'all. And uh, <laughs> I get it. But what you may not understand is that people have been here for hours already preparing, preparing for you. People have been here since 7 o'clock this morning preparing the way for you. Making sure that everything that happens here is as hospitable as it can possibly be because we want nothing to get in the way of you falling in love with Jesus and letting him be the center of your life. And so every, Gio mentioned it takes 60 volunteers or so every Sunday. What the truth is, 60 volunteers per service. We've got three services now, so you can do the math. We've probably got a fourth service on the way in the fall. And we are um, just at the point of wearing out our volunteers. We need more people to step up. You cannot see, if you're a member of this church or thinking about becoming a member, do not see this church as a consumeristic thing where you show up and are fed. Jesus is calling you out to serve in ways that make a difference. Even if it's doing something like greeting people at the door or serving people a hot cup of coffee. Our volunteers in that coffee bar, y'all understand, they're not there making money. They're not there, you know, like because they just love coffee. They're there because they know if they don't get coffee in you, nothing that happens in this room will be absorbed. It won't make any difference. You'll just, you'll just deflect it all, you know. And so they want to get the coffee to you in a way that prepares your heart for worship, for an encounter with Jesus. That's why we do teams the way that we do them. Evangelism isn't always preachy. It can be as simple as signing up to serve. Signing up to serve on a Sunday or at one of our events, like Charity Trivia Night, where we'll need probably 100 volunteers to make Charity Trivia Night work uh, next month. And you can sign up for that. You can sign up to paint the cutest little faces you will ever see next, sun, next uh, Easter Sunday, uh, at the Easter egg hunt, I mean. You can sign up to serve a meal any month, multiple times a month. We serve meals and go out into the city uh, to serve 150 homeless brothers and sisters of ours at Church Under the Bridge. It is an amazing, amazing experience. I preached the sermon there this Tuesday or Wednesday, I can't remember which day it was. And the spirit just moves in such powerful ways there when you get to know brothers and sisters you didn't even know you had. And you see their struggle, and their struggle becomes your own. And your life won't be the same. It happens every month. So church cannot be contained to one hour and four walls on a Sunday morning. The people that you see pictured behind me, they gave their New Year's Eve away to go and serve a meal at church under the bridge, which either means they are highly committed to Jesus or they have no life whatsoever, or either both. I don't know, maybe it was both. And, uh, but Jesus gave them a new life. And let me tell you, none of these people would rather have been anywhere else because they are committed to the purpose of Jesus 
in their lives and making a difference. Sometimes the ways that you step up to serve this gathering, this assembly, this ecclesia of Jesus is your own idea. Some of the best things that are happening in this church right now weren't even stuff that we programmed. And we were like, here, this is it. Now you just uh, come when you can. People were like, guys, uh, we're bored and we're out of shape. We need an exercise class. And I'm like, God bless you as long as I don't have to come. God, God bless you. You can exercise to your heart's content. Every Monday night, exercising. And somebody else was like, we need a yoga class. And I was like, oh, uh, okay, okay. And everybody shows up for yoga, man. It works. And uh, I said, it's just got to be holy yoga. I can't do just regular old, like, regular yoga. I got to have some Jesus in my yoga. So uh, we did it. And it's it's rocking, man. And, and the picture behind me shows uh, Marcellus and Jenny McZeal, who one year ago this month came to me over in the gym after we had baptized some people in this, in this uh, tank right here. Actually, it wasn't this one. It was our old horse trough. You remember the horse trough we used to baptize people in? And, uh, and, and they said to me, they said, Eric, every time you baptize someone, they look absolutely miserable. <clears throat> they said the water's too cold. The air conditioning is just blowing like crazy. No one gives them a towel or anything to dry off with. And they just, one day somebody's going to die of pneumonia because they got baptized at the story. And so they special ordered these terry cloth robes and got them embroidered and got some slippers. And now every time someone's baptized, they make sure that either they are here to support that person uh, or, or someone else that they've recruited is here to support the person being baptized. So that the experience of accepting the gift of your eternal salvation is a little less unpleasant than it might have been without, without their, their help. That is... Uh, their own initiative, doing that. Some of y'all have been to the Dominican Republic with us. We've sent three teams so far, and we'll be sending more and more. And you know, this is not typical church mission work, where it's like, it's like North American, like, colonialism all over again, like we go riding in with all our money and all of our stuff, and we're the heroes that kind of, you know, build something awesome, and then we feel good about ourselves, and go. Home. that's not at all what our work in the Dominican is like. We intentionally partner with Go Ministries because Go has the same core foundational principle that we do. And so we don't go and build some token building or paint some token wall. We go and fall in love with the people on the ground who are making a difference. And we support them. Those of you who are giving money to go through the story, you are supporting the people on the ground. You're paying the meager salaries of these church planners out in the country of the Dominican starting churches, making a difference in some really hopeless areas. So some of that involves like going and helping teach uh, Bible school, vacation Bible school in the summertime. And that involves holding some really, really cute babies and feeding some really hungry mouths. And uh, for some of the rest of us, it meant playing sports with some of the little kids. And so we started playing baseball. Um, I don't know if you know this, but Dominican people are known for being really, really good at baseball. And so they just had their way with us. These little eight-year-olds just like, I wanted to bring them and recruit them to the Oilers. You know what I mean? Just like, just... They just brutalized us adults, right? And so we stopped playing baseball for a while. We started playing basketball because we had a height advantage on them, you know. But not even that worked, as you see here, man. Like, look at the vertical on this. That, the white guy's so much taller than the kid. And the kid's like 12. And he's leaping out of, the, out of his shoes. And he doesn't even have shoes. He's in flip-flops. <laughs> and so we figured something out. Last time the team went and we figured out how to, how to not get humiliated. We brought a little gift with us uh, that they had never seen before. It was uh, an American football. And we proceeded to represent the United States of America in the best way we know how. By obliterating little kids on a football field. God bless America. We have been, and I hope will continue to be a church where Jesus is the center. Where our orders come from him. Where he gives the mandate. And we follow behind. He said already, go and witness in Jerusalem. That's the city right around you. That's what we do here in Upper Kirby, River Oaks, this more affluent part of Houston. He said, go and be my witnesses in Judea and Samaria, some of the places in the outlying parts of the city or places that are more unfamiliar to us in the city that may be un uncomfortable even. 
For some of us, and that's what we do when we go and bear witness to Jesus' love at Church Under the Bridge or with some of the human trafficking stuff that we're doing. He said, go and be my witnesses to the ends of the earth. That will, that's what we do in the Dominican Republic or in Sub-Saharan Africa where we support ministries that plant churches there as well. That's what we are doing. From right here in this room to Lichner State Jail to the Dominican Republic. This is what we're doing, and this is why. This is the why. Paul tells us, the, the Apostle Paul tells us the why in Ephesians chapter 2. Just let this soak in, all right? Just, just absorb this. Ephesians chapter 2, Paul says, You are no longer foreigners. You are no longer strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together. In him, it rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by the Spirit. The why. The why is because we all have friends who still don't know that they belong to the family of God. We all have friends and people that we love that still don't know how much their lives matter, the heritage they have in the family of God, the legacy they can leave as members of God's family, the fact that they, in their own veins have the blood of Jesus pumping through them. The DNA of Christ is within them. They are heirs to the throne of God and they don't know it yet. And we will not stop. We cannot stop until they do. Because we know what Jesus does to people and what he does to a neighborhood, to a city, and to the world. I'm, I'm praying that when you join a church or this church or when you join a team, when you sign up to lead, you understand that's what you're signing up for. Not just to be served or to be fed, but to serve and to feed. I'm praying for this church right now that over the next six months as we figure out who we're going to be long term, that that's the image of church that we maintain, that we will never become a building, that we will never become a cult of personality, that we will never be known by any one person or who the pastor is or how neat the building is or, or anything other than Jesus. I pray that you never expect Pastor Gio or, or me to, to meet all of your needs. I pray we never become a customer service culture. I pray that Jesus will always be the only real pastor here. I pray this daily because he called this assembly. This is his meeting. And we're here under his authority. And we've been given the great life-changing privilege of being his witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Let's pray together. Lord, give us courage. Each one of us who are being called into some kind of service today, some kind of action, help us to stop just standing around looking up and help us to say yes to some ways, big and small, that we can become disciples who make a difference around us. Give us courage and keep us humble. As we remember that you are the leader here. You are our pastor. And serving you is a privilege. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.